I, I'm loath to say it's been a difficult year, um, but it sort of has. Well, it's been uh, bizarre, to be quite honest. <laughs> Welcome back to Shrimping Park Farm. This is our quarterly diary of what's been happening on our organic farm in Suffolk. This was a Covid project that just carried on and on, so thank you so much for coming on the ongoing journey with us, and we are loving your feedback. Amid the amazing spring flowers, the upside of the wettest winter, I suppose, John reached the grand old age of 60. And we've had some lovely farming conversations. We went through the very, very, very sticky mud and some of us got stuck in it. Did you? Stuck in the mud. <laughs> we played stuck in the mud and then Did we actually got stuck in the mud. Our cushion has gone of, of subsidy and just, you know, there are different ways of, of, of growing crops, of different markets, different opportunities. Um, I, yeah, I just think it's, it's super exciting. It's the most exciting period in farming I've known in all of my short career of over 25 years. Back to those later, as now it's on to the main event of the season. It's lambing time again. Most of our lambs are born unassisted outside. They seem happier that way and it's manageable. So Joe and his team go out very first thing in the morning and just have a drive around and see who's given birth, if everyone's all right. Then we go out when it's a bit warmer later in the day and catch up and give an ear tag and a mark to all those born the day before. They don't do it on the day of birth because they just need to take up the colostrum and be as undisturbed as possible. They don't leave it too long because they're very, very difficult to catch the faster they get. They dock the tails. This is by putting an elastic band on it so it slowly dries off and drops off. They castrate the males so that they don't get mixed up and we have lots of unwanted teenage pregnancies later on. It also helps them grow. They give them an ear tag to identify them in our system and they give them a mark so that they can identify whose is whose while they're driving around. Every, every sheep on the farm has its own um, ear tag. So it has a unique number. So when we catch them up, put the ear tag in, we can scan them, um, and then we know how many we've got, where they are, and manage them. They also give us quite a lot of traceability. So if there was anything, an issue in the food chain, um, it could all be traced back to this, this farm. have a pop-up lambing hospital for the inevitable handful who need a little extra help. This, this, the ewe at the back, white 33, she, um, she had a full breach today, so she had one live lamb, I had to lamb the other one, but it, it, it came out, came out dead. Oh, the other one's just got two small weak lambs, so we've just brought her into monitor um, and we bought the one with the breech in um, so we can adopt the triplet onto onto her because we've had a triplet lamb last night that's got three live lambs but she's not got a huge amount of milk so she'll struggle to raise three so we've taken one off and we'll add it onto this one with a wet adoption hopefully um, and then hopefully everything's got everything's got two lambs <laughs> good luck <laughs> Bit of a wash, so we wash the scent um, from the other sheep off. So you're going to make off a it. new lamb smell, smell like, like the dead, dead lamb. lamb. 
Yeah. That's in the hope that mummy will hope. accept it. Yeah. Gosh, that's and interesting. What do you call this? A wet adoption? A wet adoption. Yeah. So it's important to take her own lamb away just for sort of half an hour, 20 minutes, um, while she bonds with that one. Um, and, and then, then you'll go back. This one back. And then she'll hopefully have two lambs, which is best, better for the ewe because it's got two lambs milking her udder. That bodes well. And when those that Joe has helped are settled, he pops them back out into the field as soon as possible, but sometimes close at hand where we can keep an eye on them for a while. causing the, a lot of different coloration um, but you could it's also getting a very different lamb um, so that so you can see the one on the right the green 20 with the brown head is much more muscular physique yeah um, and then the purple ones next to it were Romneys um, so they're a much finer slimmer lamb. yeah they do look very different I mean, we won't know till they grow up exactly how it's worked and what the form is. No, but at the moment it's looking promising. Despite rain and rain and more rain, our amazing team have got into the fields in the snatches whenever they can. It's time to start taking up some grass and clover lays, the soil feeding bit of our rotation. Being organic, we can't spray them off. So we have to get the moment right and then we can do it with a very shallow cultivation. We planted the spring oats in between our rows of trees in the agroforestry, albeit a little later than we'd hoped due to the rain, like hey ho. And then it's time for some planting in an already sown field. So what are you doing here, Rufus? We're sowing our herbal maize for this year, which has been under sown into our oats. These fields of fields have already been drilled. This is clover seed you're putting in. Yeah. Okay. And this is going underneath a growing crop for next year's fertility building lay. Yes. So this crop will be harvested, and then underneath there should be clover that will come up after harvest. So the ground is never going to be clear. No, that's the point. Yeah. It's a tiny little hopper. Are the seeds that small? The seeds are tiny. And so I'm following up the rolls, um, which is a nice little job. And the idea of that is to firm the seed into the soil so we get a uh, better seed to soil contact, which will improve the germination. And we'll also hopefully hold in the moisture. So have you nearly finished all the drilling, Rufus, of all the cereal crops? There's one field left. <laughs> How's the drilling been, Rufus? Wet. Wet and then suddenly very, very dry. Tricky because everything's going in very, very late. Um, and so every day it goes in later is another yield lost, which we can't afford at this point. You're looking quite unshaven, Rufus. Had there been some late nights? It's been a long drilling season. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to meet the grass. We had not mommy. one orphan in the main lambing season. <laughs> Young visitors to the farm love watching Joe train his dogs. <laughs> this term we also drill down on the story of how these little tiny wheat seeds are vital to our staple diet. How we grow them, how we grind them, how we eat them. 
We also spent hours just testing our ability to really look at the world around us. And the wonderful pupils from Lorschel Year 6, yes, I promise to give them a shout out, even decorated boot jacks with what they'd seen as a memento of all their school visits before heading off to their senior school. On your marks, get set, And go. sometimes it's just fun being outside. But late in the spring, we're making preparations for the winter ahead. We heat the farm on wood chip made from farm coppice. That's cutting trees, but protecting their roots and their shoots. It's a traditional method of timber production. But we're experimenting with harvesting thinned trees from the planting we did in the 1990s. If it works, we intend to bring our hedges back into the coppice rotation, i.e. letting them get much bigger, not trimming them every year, then chopping them and coppicing them and letting them grow back. It's how it was done before the days of mechanical hedge trimming, and hopefully it will mean our hedges are at different stages throughout the farm for a more diverse habitat. Let's hope our boilers can cope with this different sized chip. But with all this rain, as well as the crops, the weeds are growing and growing. Here the team have snatched a moment to hoe between the rows of wheat and the bean by crop. During World War II, the 487th Bomb Group, part of America's 8th Air Force, operated from this farm. Come rain or shine, now an annual event, we read the names of all those who died flying from here. John has had their names engraved on a memorial in front of the control tower. My name is Sarah Morak. I'm representing the 40th Fighter Wing. It's a great honor to come out here and be able to memorialize the 233 members that passed away um, and just be part of the local community and uh, share our shared history here. If you just think about all of the little airstrips that were around this area in Norfolk and Suffolk counties that I'm aware of, like, and I know there was even more, so all the, the lives that were lost and it's just like, it's so amazing that we still have people that care this much to come out and help make sure that they're not forgotten. This year, the people of Alfeton, the village at the centre of this enormous build, planted an oak tree and forged a memorial P, the letter which would have been on every B-17 and B-24 flying from this site. But there's no rest for the shepherd. Now the lambing's done, it's on to the shearing. <laughs> Try and shear on and off between the showers a week. Um, so we haven't got a huge amount done, but we've got some done. If we didn't shear them, they get something called fly strike. So flies lay eggs in the in the wool, particularly um, around the back end soils, bits of wool, and the eggs hatch out and become maggots, and then the maggots basically eat the eat, eat the flesh of the sheep, um, which is very very grim. Um, so shearing prevents that. It also get, get, keeps them a bit more comfortable in the in the summer. Um, cools them down a bit and the wool is also a product you know so we sell the wool through British Wool Board. They're looking a little bit muddy is that because it's been raining? Yeah uh, yeah it's been raining and it's just been a very very wet winter so everything's a bit bit muddy. These are a long wool breed of sheep so they've got they've got woolly bellies they've got woolly heads woolly um, cheeks and faces so they get mud and uh, you know everything else everywhere. We're in a fairly good good position but it's just it's just been very very wet. We're trying to use the sheep to keep our ponds in good order as well. Seems a bit mad, but when we put up temporary fencing, we're trying to include the ponds, like this one, which we restored a few years ago. We don't want the growth to come up on the outside because that will eventually detract light from the pond. And the more light you have, the more plants you have, the more biodiversity you have. So we're putting the sheep to good use. When the sun shines, we are looking ahead to the winter. All this rain has meant an amazing growing year and the country is awash with grass. So we're turning it into hay for the winter when there won't be any. Make hay while the sun shines.
Madame de Jane, and we are baling your haylage for your sheep. So how many times do you wrap round one bale? Wraps it round 26 times. Wow. Twin radar. And yep. what's the weight of one bale? About 300 kilos. What does one of these balers cost, Sam? Um, I think new, they're about £80,000 now. Wow. Yeah, for a combi baler. So you've got to make a lot of bales to make that pay? You've got to make a lot of bales. What oh. year, Sam? <laughs> the season's been dreadful, really. Um, we've had these rain, you know, these rain showers, um, but then things haven't stopped growing, so trying to keep on top of that. Um, we've had some grass that's not as thick as we'd like but because of these colder nights, um, sat wet, grass actually doesn't like sitting wet, it likes water but not sitting in water, so it's a bit all over the place. The sun's finally come out so these lovely sheep are just lying in the shade. Big lambs now. We collect up all our old sea bags and all the haylage wrap and send it off in bulk to be recycled. But back on the crops front, this cold showery weather is not great for the beans. Uh, so you can see there's some wheat in there and also some beans that are just podding up on the stems. So it's growing uh, and there's a black grass plant. Um, it needs a temperature of uh, 15 degrees or below and and wet to have this disease called chocolate spot which uh, which infests the leaves if it develops it then these lesions here not lesions but these spots um, cover the whole leaf uh, and eventually it'll defoliate the plant and and that is not a problem if it's near to harvest but uh, these beans are still quite small and so they still need sunshine and leaf area uh, to to fill the pods, you know, if you get a little bit of sunshine, um, have you just eaten that? Yeah. If you get a little bit of sunshine in the afternoon, rain in the morning, sunshine in the afternoon, it tends to keep the stuff at bay. So it can go one of two ways: brilliant or rubbish. Well, they say with beans, they're a sorry crop. You are either sorry you grew them or you sorry you didn't grow more. We've had nearly 450 millimeters of rain so far this year, more than 25 percent above our normal average and the newly restored ponds are filling quickly. Perhaps they love the rain as much as the weeds do. The crops are too tall to hoe now, so our fabulous team have been comb cutting. This lovely machine has static knives that pass through the field, not affecting the crop, but chopping off the fleshy stemmed weeds. It's really successful actually. And sometimes there's nothing that can beat doing it by hand. It's always tough, this hand roguing, as it's called. But this year, our glorious Philip and his team have had their work cut out. More so, weeds this year than normal? Well, I'd say that it's about four times more than usually. Wow. So it's, it's like, it's really bad. But still, fingers crossed that this will give us opportunity to pull most of them. The weather is miserable, but it's good for we to come out of the ground because it's easier to pull them obviously and well luckily for us some conventional farms look far worse than this one so it's not that bad but we're still <laughs> bending over backwards just to do something impossible possible yeah that's that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> but those late drilled spring crops are looking amazing silver linings perhaps Hello. getting ready for groundswell john in its eighth year, and increasing amounts of people and corporates getting on board in the knowledge that we cannot keep farming in the same old way. Hi, my name's John Sherry, and I set up Groundswell because there's this whole exciting regenerative agriculture movement around the world, and there didn't seem to be any way of um, eulogising about it, um, so we thought we'd do our own show, so this is what we've done. 67% of farmers are over 60, and this event is full of young people interested in growing things. And what makes it is just all the lovely people here, and it, that's why it works. It's just the enthusiasm, optimism of all the farmers and food producers. Preceding the general election by a few days, there was a lot of chat about what any new government must do. Those resisting this movement to a more sustainable way of farming always tell us that the public don't want change. But it does seem like there's a lot of people who do want good, nutritious food ethically produced. Um, 
I've come to Groundswell just to learn more uh, today about, well, learn from people. This great source of information. There's loads of people doing different things. Um, and what, uh, What's the take home message this year from Groundswell? I, I've only been here five minutes. Literally, I didn't come <laughs> yesterday. I'm late to the party. Um, uh, I, I think change, change is possible. Our cushion is gone of, of subsidy and just, you know, there are different ways of, of, of growing crops, of different markets different opportunities. Um, I, yeah, I just think it's, it's super exciting. It's the most exciting period in farming I've known in all of my short career of over 25 years. What do you think you're going to change? Go on, give us one thing What do you think might I'm change? going to change? Yeah. Uh, I think I'm going to change my, um, uh, pro probably uh, my uh, ambition. I'm going to be a little braver, I think, in growing crops. I think, why not? Growing different crops? Uh, growing different crops, growing crops uh, different ways. Uh, yeah, I think I think there are you know lots of ways to do, lots of things to, to, to take take home. It's just people really want to know how to do this thing. There was a loud voice for the joining up of health, eating, and environmental issues with farming policy. This work's already been done by Henry Dimbleby in the National Food Strategy, and some are calling for the new government to get on and push go on some of the recommendations in that very thorough report. What uh, Organics and Regen is trying to do is to try and build more soil health, uh, bring nature back to our farms. Uh, I mean, Organic is different to Regen because it has a set of standards rather than a set of principles, but I think the ambition of Regen is incredibly exciting. Are you a regen farmer? Well, organic has to be regenerative by default because, you know, we haven't used any pesticides or artificial fertilizers for the last 25 years. And yet we're still producing crops. So, yeah, I feel um, part of that whole thing. And the rain keeps coming into July. We've had a lot of visitors to the farm this spring an annual dawn bird walk with the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, followed by a very good breakfast and a chat. We were lucky enough to have a visit from the famous naturalist Mark Cocker, who led an evening's nature immersion, a nature writing workshop as ever, followed by a delicious local organic meal. It was so successful he's promised to come back next year. The barn has been used for everything from weddings to parties and even turned into a French market and a jazz club. Not bad for an old Victorian farm barn, which wouldn't fit a tractor in anymore. It's been rather an amazing spring at the end of it all because uh, we've had a mixture of sunshine and showers, which means that all the spring crops that we drilled, although they were late, um, are looking incredible at the moment, I have to say. And actually we've got grass coming out of our ears. Harvest, I think, uh, is going to be good, bad and ugly, to be honest. So, uh, I'm feeling uh, optimistic. Uh, well, the combine's poised on its blocks in the yard. And all the sheep are enjoying the clover. Wheat and the beans, by crop, is almost ripe. Thank you so much for joining us. Please do subscribe and follow us on Instagram for more updates from the farm. But for now, harvest, here we go. See you on the other side. We crush the seeds and then we put the maize flour and we put the flour in to make the bread. And what? we did half whole bread and half white. And the combine harvester was the only one that was not pulled by a tractor. You were really listening! And what, oh, what's that noise? That's probably the loader, isn't it's it? The, the tractor, probably. Probably the tractor.